With the last video on the Greeks, I want to give a little bit of respect to the myths. Okay, I know we talk, you talk about myths in middle school. I wish I could focus more time because they're so cool. And the idea of the gods and the gods controlling everything and the stories that were told is such a neat and interesting aspect of history. However, unfortunately, we just don't have the time to really focus in on that in class. Um, but I do want to give respect to what myths did and how myths, the myths of the gods really, you know, complement a lot of the myths you see in Judeo-Christian belief. They complement a lot of the myths, obviously, in Roman culture, and they complement a lot of the myths in the old Egyptian and ancient Mesopotamian culture as well. Okay? So the Greeks were great storytellers. They sought to understand nature and, and their human passion. Understand with history, history tends to repeat itself very often. When we get to the Renaissance, the Renaissance are going to recollect and look back at the Greeks and the Romans and this idea of human passion, the human person as being most important, and that human passion and why things occur in their history and why things occur in their daily life go through the myths, and these are the stories about the gods. Okay, And there are a ton of gods, and we know this, and you know about Zeus, um, and how important he was and Zeus is that God figure you know it's a great story of how Zeus came to be he is born from the Titans his father tries to eat his brothers and sisters Zeus saves them and becomes the God of all gods now he and his brother Poseidon and his brother Hades have to draw lots which is a great looking into of the idea of drawing lot in democratic Athens of, of who's going to get the long straw who's going to get the short straw and of course Zeus draws the long straw and he chooses the heavens to be the god over you know Poseidon draws the next size straw and he chooses the oceans to be in control over and Hades draws the short straw and he is the god of the underworld and of course Hades is what you would later know as hell so the stories are wonderful and how the people live their life in response to the gods. You know, the Olympics are done in response to the gods. They're done for the gods and honoring the gods. And here's a sculpture of Zeus and Hera, all right, the god and goddesses uh, of Greece. Okay, you know, Zeus obviously can transform himself into many characters. He had his wife, his main wife, Hera, who is also his sister. Uh, and all these stories really kind of go out. But there's a great story about Zeus, and it's a flood story. You know, Zeus had gone in and, and watched what humans were doing to each other and the cannibalization that they were, they were having, and he decided to flood the world, to cleanse the Greeks of what they were doing wrong. Ironically enough, that's is very close to a Judeo-Christian flood story of Noah's Ark, how God God is watching what humans are doing, and he floods the sin away. And water tends to be a cleansing symbol all throughout different religions and different history. So here you have Zeus and Hera. All right, she is in honor of him. Of course, she is the goddess of marriage, amongst many other things. But Zeus definitely is in control. Another great story of the Greeks is the idea of the Trojan War. Now, you guys should be more familiar with the Trojan War with the movie Troy with Brad Pitt, which is a pretty good, actually, historical re recollection of the events. Um, but it's between what was a group called the Mycenaeans from Mycenae, which is a Greek city-state, and independent Troy. And Troy is found on Anatolia, um, not a Greek. They're not Greek. Uh, and, of course, you know the story of the Trojan War centers around Helen of Troy. Okay, so this story looks to kind of explain how one Greek loses his beautiful wife to the young uh, Paris of Troy, and he joins together and unifies with other Greeks, including the famous warrior Achilles, and they sail to Troy to attack the Trojans uh, and take back his beautiful wife. Of course, Paris will be killed by Achilles, and then Hector will kill um uh, Achilles in his heel, the one spot of his body as a demigod that was not protected by the gods when he was dipped in the river Styx. And there's all these intricate weavings and ideas of Greek storytelling, which is mainly described through Homer. Homer is a wonderful storyteller. The Iliad and the Odyssey being his two major stories. The ten years of the Trojan War with the Iliad, and then the ten years of Odysseus and his travels home. You know, these are epics. These are long, drawn-out stories that really tell the Greeks about their history and who they are. And really showing the Greek strength. You know, the Greeks will overcome the Trojans. You know, you have the great story about the Trojan horse and hiding inside the belly of the horse 
given to the uh, Trojans as a as a gift by by a random group, and then as the Trojans are enjoying the evening and getting drunk and, and and falling asleep, the Greeks jump out of the belly of the Trojan horse and massacre them. You know, these are all really great stories of which Greeks love to tell, and it really tells at the true nature of who the Greeks were. Of course, you know, the main story focuses on Helen of Troy, okay? Uh, he is taken by Paris, the beautiful young, you know, the handsome young prince whose brother Hector is going to protect him. You know, their stories are forever sealed together. You know, but ironically enough, this story has nothing to do with Helen of Troy. It's really about trade routes. You know, you can't tell a story about trade routes. That's flat out boring. You tell a story about a beautiful woman and a hero and another hero and an anti-hero and the unification of Greeks and these trips and these massive and how the gods reacted. And that makes a good story. Not trade routes. But that's what it was over because the Greeks needed resources. They needed to control the Mediterranean. And what they found is that they believed that the Trojan War actually did happen because they found a lot of artifacts of bronze which would have fit the time period of the Bronze Age of the Greeks. All right, the last part I want to focus on with Greece deals with its culture, its philosophies, and its art. You know, again, like I mentioned uh, earlier and even in the last video, uh, the Greeks are going to be a... Uh, early kind of idea for the Renaissance humanists, um, you know, its culture, it's going to reflect in what the Romans do. Uh, they're going to carry it over and it's going to carry right into the Renaissance. And again, it's kind of resurfacing again, carried into the modern age. You know, you can look at, uh, you know, 18th century art and architecture is very similar as well. So let's look at the culture uh, of Greek culture, of course, of Greek philosophers and of art. Okay, a philosopher means a lover of wisdom. You know, a, a philosopher is someone who wants to study, who wants to learn, who wants to preach his ideas to others. Okay, so they're trying to learn more. And really what they're looking for is questioning. They're questioning why. With philosophy, especially Greek philosophy of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, it's a step away from what is the norm because they don't look at the gods as directly. It's what you would call Greek rationalism. It's actually looking at situations and trying to figure out why. You know, that's a big question for this class is why, especially with Aristotle with scientific method, it's trying to examine what's going on and not just saying, well, the gods did it. You know, this is kind of a, a really good precursor for the scientific revolution, which stems from the Reformation, of course, questioning the Catholic Church, which we'll get into later. And it also is a really good precursor for Darwin and the theories of evolution that will come and really counteract what many... Um, Christians and even many religious people believe is wrong. So, you know, this idea of rationalizing the world in itself away from a deity that's really controlling it. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is Socrates. Um, Socrates is kind of, there are a lot of philosophers out there, but Socrates is really the first one to kind of catapult this Greek rationalism. Of course, here is Socrates, uh, typical of an educated, especially a well-to-do man in Greece wearing the beard. Now, what Socrates built his philosophy on is this idea that there has to be truth and justice in standards. Whatever is out there, it just doesn't happen because. There has to be some kind of truth to why something exists, and there has to be some kind of justice to it as well as why it happens. Okay, And the way he figured that he can try to rationalize these ideas and try to gain information is through what is we know today as Socratic method. And it's simply question and answer. Asking questions to figure out answers until you get the standards of what you do believe is correct. Okay, So Socrates was very adamant that he needed to go off and ask questions and challenge other philosophers who couldn't answer those questions. Now, because of this, in Athens, what ends up happening is these young men who are going off to train under Socrates are doing the same thing. They're asking questions. They're trying to find out answers. And unfortunately, they're getting answers that the government does not like. And what they do is they take Socrates and they make him the fall guy. They put him on trial for corrupting the youth of Athens, making them answer a lot of questions about why things are going on, not necessarily agreeing with how the government was working. And he is sentenced to death and he has to drink hemlock, which is a poison uh, that he has to drink himself. And he rightfully uh, or he justly takes it because he does believe in though his conviction is wrong, that this is what truth really did. He got through a justice system. They believed that the truth was rationalized, and he accepted his penalty. 
Now, a great quote from Socrates, and I love this one, a man only shows his ignorance when he opens his mouth. If you think about that for a second, it is so prophetic. The man, when he just speaks wide open, does not think about what he's saying, is showing how ignorant he is, and it's a great quote. One of his students was Plato. Okay, Plato's the next philosopher. And there's Plato again with the beard. Plato's theories kind of center around um, this ideal society. Okay, uh, Plato wrote allegories. Um, one of his big ones is the allegory of the cave, where you are a prisoner in a cave, and your back is to the opening of the cave, and you see the shadows, and you hear the noises, but what really is going on behind you? And this questioning mentality, you know, kind of... Plato takes and looks at ideas in a different way. And when he writes this book called The New Republic, he looks at how society should be in his mind. And again, much, much different than uh, Socrates because he's going to put something in a kind of a deity form, but it's going to be a person and not a god. So in his ideal society, you have your farmers and your peasants at the bottom rung of class. You have your warriors who are trained to protect. And then you have your rich ruling class that should make the decisions. But society must be led by what is known as a philosopher king. You need to underline philosopher king because that's so important. It is somebody who is well educated, well thought out, um, strong, willing to fight, and great on the battlefield. And of course, the perfect uh, example of a philosopher king for Plato would be Alexander the Great. You know, if you look later down the road, you can look at George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, to a degree Napoleon, even though he kind of fell apart. Uh, you can look at FDR, President FDR. Um, there are so many great leaders that were great in war as well and very well educated that were able to move a society forward. And that's really Plato's main main focus here uh, with his theories in society, a step up from where Socratic method went. And of course, lastly, a uh, great quote by him, a man may easily do harm, but not every man can do good to one another. And that's a wonderful quote. You know, in theory, humans are evil beings. It is very difficult for us to do good. It's so much easier for us to do harm. And if you think about that in your own life, how many times you could have helped someone, even at the most menial task, could have been important there. Now, one of his students was Aristotle. And, of course, Aristotle is the big philosopher here. And, again, there's a picture of Aristotle. All right, he's going to help establish the first idea of scientific method to go and test data, come up with a hypothesis and test data. Now, most of Aristotle's theories have been proven wrong. Uh, his geocentric idea, the sun is at the center of the, I mean, the earth is at the center of the universe. The idea of why the earth are, or the way we are on this earth, why the seasons move their way. Most of his method has been proven wrong, especially by Newton. However, the big part is he actually established thought. He actually established a process by which people can learn and rationalize what is going on around them. And of course, this goes with, uh, arguing philosophy and ideas according to logic, not just spewing ideas, but actually using logic to come up with a good argument against someone else. Now, Aristotle <clears throat> will be the marker for all scientists down the road, and as he's proven wrong, it actually amplifies his greatness because he was so far ahead of the curve when it came to scientific thought. And of course, he's going to teach Alexander the Great, um, which is going, which we talked about before in the last video. So the philosophies of Greece are going to recirculate and recome back, uh, come back again when we get to the Renaissance, and we'll look at those down the road, especially into the scientific revolution.